Duncan. Good, good to see you, Dustin. Um, now, with the Parkes Telescope, it was commissioned actually 60 years ago um, this year. And, um, and when it was built, it was the second largest but most advanced radio telescope in the world. Um, it was originally, well, it was built at 210 metres or 64 metres in diameter. And, um, um, and it's essentially just a glorified radio antenna, which we use to study the radio emissions from the stars. And as a result, uh, and because of that, we refer to it as a radio telescope. So we only receive signals, we don't transmit. Now, um, it was recognised very early on, in fact, even before the telescope's construction was completed, that it was a near ideal instrument for tracking spacecraft in deep space that is well away from the orbit of the moon, you know, towards the planets and so on. And so NASA um, uh, had a lot of interest in the telescope's design because they were at that time planning the large antennas for their fledgling deep space network, which was a network of three stations around the globe, about equally spaced, about 120 degrees apart. So that as the Earth rotated, each of the stations could come into view of distant spacecraft and so they could maintain constant communication with it. And so they were thinking about building really large antennas for that. And so when they saw the construction of the Parkes Telescope, they had a lot of interest in it. And, um, um, and so they approached the CSIRO at the time to see if it could be included in the deep space network, the fledgling deep space network. The offer was knocked back by the CSIRO because they wanted to use it for radio astronomy, which is the purpose of, of the reason it was being built. But the CSIRO did agree that whenever a strong, stable, reliable signal was required, um, especially at critical moments in the, in the upcoming space missions, then parks would be involved. And they would agree on an agency to agency basis, you know. And so, um, and to this day, it's still the rationale for us being involved in space missions. It's only the space work we do is a very small part of what we do, less than, you know, one or 2%, but it's invariably the most famous things we do. So that's all the public here. So they think that's, that's all we do, but we do a lot more. We're first and foremost, a radio astronomy observatory, still doing world-class science, still making discoveries that are shaping and revolutionizing our understanding of the universe. And so, um, um, and so that's where our reputation, where our most of the work is. But whenever NASA's required help or other space agencies, they've come to us to, to help out just for those short periods where they really need us. And so we've always agreed to, to do that. And in fact, when NASA went on, in fact, the very first space mission that, that's, that the Parkes Telescope was involved in was Mariner 2 in December of 1962. The telescope was just over a year old by then. Um, it already made some world, world um, um, very revolutionary discoveries about the universe. Um, and so we tracked the first spacecraft, the Mariner 2, the first interplanetary space, as it flew by Venus in December of 62. And uh, it was so successful that NASA decided that from there on, the, the big antennas that they were going to build for their deep space network were to be 64 metres in diameter, just like Parks. Okay. And so the first impact that Parks had, had on the space tracking um, um, history was in the design of the big antennas for tracking spacecraft. Because the signals that, we, that you detect from space are incredibly weak, um, Dustin. Um, and um, it's, it's often difficult for people to appreciate just how weak the signal is. And so if you want a strong signal, you need a large collecting area to collect enough of that, that very weak energy so that you have enough signal to detect and analyze. So um, being 64 meters in diameter makes it extremely sensitive. Um, to give you an example of just how sensitive the, um, the, um, the, the telescope is, if you were to put a mobile telephone on the surface of the moon and turn it on, then that phone 400,000 kilometers away would be one of the strongest radio sources in the sky for us. Okay. Amazing. We can detect that phone from, from, the, um, from the moon and we definitely have no trouble detecting it from the car park and the surrounding area around park, which is why we ask people to switch their phones and other electrical equipment off so that the, the energy that they, those, that equipment um, emits doesn't overwhelm the even feebler signal 
that we, we trying to detect from the stars, okay? So the first impact that Parkes had was with the design of the telescopes. In fact, it went so well that um, in 1964, so 1965, just three years later, Parkes tracked the, the first uh, Mariner 4 spacecraft as it flew by Mars and returned the first ever close-up pictures of the Martian surface. They had hoped that the first of the big 64 meter antennas that NASA was building at Goldstone in California would be ready in time, but it wasn't. So they needed another big antenna. So they asked Parks to help and we did. We, we tracked it for, a, for several weeks and received the 22 images from that mission. By today's standards, they're, they're very poor images, very, very grainy. You could barely make out anything, but nonetheless, it was quite an achievement in its day and, um, and was, a, was a real triumph. And of course, the most famous missions that we tracked were the, the, the Apollo man lunar landing missions from Apollo's 11 all the way to 17. Um, and we can talk about that more later on, okay? Um, but by, by the end of the Apollo missions um, in 1972, um, the other big antennas in its network were already built. The big one, 64 meter antenna at Tidbinbilla near Canberra was built. And so Parks really wasn't required for the next decade or so until Voyager 2 flew by Uranus in January of 1986. And then NASA had the idea of actually linking the two antennas together so they could double the signal strength um, and get more information down from, Mar from Voyager 2 as it flew by Uranus. And it worked so well, they did it again three years later when Voyager 2 flew by Neptune in um, August of 1989. And again, was able to do even more, return even more science as a result, which was really great. And then in the mid nineties, which is when I came to Parks, um, we were contracted by NASA to track the, um, the, the Galileo spacecraft when it flew by, um, well, also when it was orbiting Jupiter, they needed, because um, I, en route to the planet, the, the antenna that was supposed to open up like an umbrella, um, flew like an umbrella, failed to do that. The straps wouldn't let it go and he got stuck. So they had to resort to using the, the weaker omnidirectional antenna. And, um, and in fact, it looked like the mission was gonna be a total disaster because they were down to just 10 bits per second if by using that. Had the big antenna worked, they would have had 139,000 bits a second. So you can see the big difference. So NASA again had the idea of linking parks with the antennas at Tidbinbilla and at Goldstone and thereby boosting the signal to 160 bits per second which again, doesn't sound like very much, but uh, much, much better than 10 bits. And um, by using clever image compression, impression, image compression algorithms, um, they were able to salvage something like 70% of the science. So from going, it went from being a total disaster to, to actually a very successful mission. So they needed us for 10 hours every day for one year, which we, we supported them on. And that's what brought me to Parks. Um, at the end of that, we then um, upgraded the telescope a little more and we were able to support the Mars rovers en route to Mars um, in 2003, 2004. And yeah, yeah and then in January, that's right, spirit and opportunity, um, as well as other spacecraft orbiting Mars and Voyager 2 and, and other things. So um, there was a big traffic jam at Mars in those, in those days, so they didn't have enough antennas to track everything. So they asked Parks to help and we said, yeah, no problems. We're always there to help. Um, so we did that. Two years later, we tracked um, the Huygens probe when it landed on the big moon of Saturn. And in fact, we were meant as a backup for the uh, equivalent experiment on the mother craft, but the Germans forgot to switch the receiver on for that. And so they didn't get the signals. We were able to detect the signal direct, direct from Earth. And so we salvaged that experiment and were able to to measure the winds on Titan um, as the probe was descending um, uh, under parachute. Um, that was amazing that night. And, um, and then in 2012, we, we tracked the, the Curiosity rover when it was landing on Mars. That was really fantastic because Andy needed us for seven minutes. Um, and, but we spent a year preparing for it, but everything worked beautifully that day. I can't, still can't believe it worked so well. And the most recent space tracking work that we've done was with Voyager 2 when he crossed the helios, heliopause and moved into interstellar space. NASA didn't know when it was going to meet the heliopause. 
Um, but about early, early October, they had indications that it was getting very close. So they asked us to help. We agreed to do it. We had two weeks to set everything up and ready to go. And during the, the first few days in early November, when we were doing the tests, it crossed the helios, heliopause, moved into interstellar space, and we continued tracking it for four, four months after that to get as much data as possible. So that was really fascinating. For me in particular, because I remember when the spacecraft Voyager 2 was launched, it was launched in August of 1977 when I was in year nine. And in fact, um, um, it was the same week that Elvis Presley died. So while everyone else was obsessing over Elvis, I, I was fascinated by Voyager 2. I mean, little did I know that some, what, 42 years later, um, I'd actually, you know, be tracking it as it left the solar system. So that was really fascinating. So we've been able to support these missions over the years, Dustin, um, because of the great sensitivity. We have something that, that other antennas don't have, and that's a large aperture, which means it's very sensitive. Um, to build a telescope like this will cost hundreds of millions of dollars. It's cheaper just to ask us to help out for the few days they need us or whatever. <laughs> and we're always happy to do that. The money we get from that, we put back into the telescope where we upgrade the, the telescope with new equipment, um, uh, improve the structure of the telescope. And so we're able to continue with our world-class radio astronomy here. And so that's why we support it. Um, in recent years, now NASA has plans to return um, people to the moon, and um, they've also contracted commercial private companies to send commercial unmanned landers to the moon. And so um, in March this year, we announced that we had contracted with Intuitive Machines. It's a small Texas-based company um, to track their first lunar lander um, early next year, which we're, we're really looking forward to do. And, um, and we're also um, negotiating with other commercial companies um, about tracking their, their, their moon missions. And so, um, you know, there'll be more to announce in the coming months. You'll probably hear it in the press when we do announce them. So, you know, the, the, the legacy of parks in space tracking is, is really quite impressive. We were there from the very beginning of, the, of um, in, interplanetary space travel, and we're still there still working to, to, to see that it, that it continues into the future and so on. Um, the telescope's been able to do that because it was well designed to begin with. So we've been able to upgrade it continuously over the years, not just the, the, the surface and, the, on, and other parts of the structure, but all the inside bits. So today it's fully computer controlled. It's, um, um, we have cryogenic cooled receivers uh, fiber optic lines transporting the data around the country, and we even operate the telescope over the internet. Um, and so um, the combined upgrades, both external and internal, have today made the telescope over 10,000 times more sensitive than when it was built. And so that's why it's in, in great demand, why other, other space agencies and other nations want to use it. And of course, we'll be there supporting any Australian mission that they that they propose that that the Australian Space Agency is proposing. So that'll be really exciting um, in the coming years. So you know, young students today, um, just at school, you know, um, you've got great prospects in the future to work in a, in the space industry. Um, the 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 space in industry in Australia is, as they say, you know, um, pun intended, looking up, um, and so. Um, you know, there's, um, there's a lot there and um, a lot of fascinating, really interesting work in the future. And hopefully once we get over this pandemic, everything will be back to normal and, and we'll be able to, um, to do these really exciting things. Definitely. Now you had some questions about Apollo 11 too, I think. Is that uh, right? Yes. So one of them was what were Parks' main focuses during the Apollo missions? So it's okay. main areas that helped out in. Yeah, well, as I said, um, the first Apollo mission we, we tracked was the um, Apollo 11. In fact, it's the, the first manned mission then um, that we've tracked. Everything's been all unmanned, um, but it was Apollo 11. Because it was the first lunar landing, um, NASA was, was very conscious. They wanted the largest, most sensitive instruments around the world tracking it at the time, especially during those critical hours that the lunar module was on the lunar surface. And so they, they asked Parks in um, October of 1968 whether CSO would be interested. And the reply was that they would be, um, especially because it was such a high profile mission, but also 
there were human lives at stake. And so CSO wanted to help ensure that it, um, it could contribute to the success of that. Um, meetings were convened in February um, 1969 at our headquarters in Sydney to nut out all the, 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 the requirements and procedures. And then over the coming months, everything worked towards making sure that would happen. Originally, um, Parks was to be a backup for the big antenna at Goldstone in California because the lunar landing was, was to occur at about, at about quarter past six in the morning in Australia. Uh, but that was still about, set, about six hours, six, seven hours from the time the moon rose for us. And so in the original plan, the astronauts were to come out and do the moonwalk straight after landing. Okay, and um, they were also going to deploy a television camera so that the world can witness the, 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 the moonwalk. But about two months before the mission, the plans changed. The, the, the was decided that the astronauts will have a sleep first and then they'd come out. And the, on that new revised schedule, the moon, um, the astronauts were going to come out at about 20 past four in the afternoon in Australia on the 21st of July. Which, but by then the, the 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 moon would have set at Goldstone. So Parks suddenly went from being the backup uh, in case there was a delayed moonwalk or some other other um, or early liftoff to suddenly being the prime station for the um, for the moonwalk and especially and in particular for the television because they weren't sure just how strong the signal would be uh, and they wanted to make sure that. For the at least for the the television, they had a large antenna on the Earth to, to get that strong signal and give a, a, a reasonable image, to so the world can view it. Um, again, on the original plan, the astronauts were going to open up this three meter diameter antenna like an umbrella, pointed at the at the Earth and transmit the signal. But because the NASA wanted pictures of Armstrong coming down the ladder, that would be before he could unfurl that umbrella. So they needed, they ended up using just a two foot antenna on the roof of the, the lunar module. Now that meant that they'd be transmitting a weaker signal. So to compensate, they wanted a big antenna on the earth to pick up that signal. And so at that at the time that the, 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 the moonwalk was scheduled, the revised schedule, the only really big antenna was parks. And so we came in specifically for the TV of that. Um, and but on the day everything changed again because <laughs> the, the astronauts landed and um they weren't going to sleep you know they were just too excited would you sleep you just landed on the moon dustin would you go to sleep sorry i'm just going to have a little nap and wake up all you're going to do is stay awake and come out even more tired than if you than 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 you already were so armstrong exercised his option as the commander and said he's coming out early and so suddenly at Parks, everyone thought, oh, good, all that work that we, we'd been doing to prepare for would go to waste. The moonwalk would be over before it rose at Parks. And, um, but as, as things happened, um, the astronauts were, were, were careful in, their, 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 in, in coming out. You know, they wanted to make sure that they didn't make any mistakes. They took time putting on their, donning their space, their EVA suits and um, depressurizing the cabin and some. So by the time the, um, the, they were about to come out, the moon was on the verge of rising at Parks. The Parks telescope's horizon is 30 degrees above the true horizon. Okay, we don't tip all the way to the true horizon. It only goes down to about 30 degrees. And so the moon wasn't set to rise above that 30 degree elevation horizon until 1.04 in the afternoon. Okay, and so um, it looked like, you know, it wasn't going to happen. But as... As time went by, the astronauts were, were being careful in what they did. The moon was slowly rising and rising, and it looked like the parts may actually make it. You know, we may get the signal um, as they came out. So the dish was fully tipped over right on the horizon, waiting for the moon to rise. And, um, um, and just then, about 20 minutes before, a violent squall hit the telescope. And there was... Um, um, two gusts of wind that, that peaked at 110 kilometres an hour, which caused the tower to shudder and sway and create a lot of concern for the people inside. John Bolton, the legendary first director of the observatory, he held his nerve, told his men to stay on it, and just as Buzz Aldrin switched on the, the TV camera um, from inside the lunar module, um, the, the moon just moved into the field of view of the Parkes telescope. And we were able to receive the signal simultaneously with our colleagues at Honeysuckle Creek near Canberra 
as well as the big antenna at Goldstone because it hadn't set there yet. Okay, so um, so at the beginning of the broadcast, NASA uh, was using the feed from Goldstone because, you know, they said, well, we've got a big dish high up in the sky. We'll just use that one. Unfortunately, the operator of the the t of the scan converter for the TV was inexperienced and he had all the wrong settings. The picture was upside down. Um, it was very dark, not very good at all. Because remember, the, the moon the moonwalk wasn't supposed to happen at, at that time with the revised schedule. So the, the, the operator was not the experienced one on, on shift at that time. Um, the TV camera from the moon was non-standard because they were limited by power and bandwidth, Dustin. They, um, they used what's called a slow scan TV. It was black and white. It was only 320 lines per frame and it was 10 frames a second. So okay. like, but, yeah. Compared to now. Yeah, it's very, very basic. It's very yeah. basic. But what it did was it um and but you can't you can't broadcast to people's TVs at home because you know it, it that it's not it's not a commercial standard. So the only way they in 1969 they could do it was to display the picture on little monitors about this big, 10 inches, about that big, and they pointed another TV camera at that. And it was the output of that TV, which was a standard TV camera. That was that the world saw, and because the camera on the lunar module was upside down, it was in this little little mesa, little pallet. That when Armstrong was at the top of the ladder, he pulled the little lanyard, which caused it to drop down, and the camera was sitting on the top, upside down, because that was the only flat part, and it was pointing at the ladder. Now, people knew that that should be that picture would be up upside down, so they were supposed to um, um, have a little switch on the Earth that would invert the image. But the, the Goldstone operator, because he was inexperienced, he had it in the wrong setting. He had it for the upright image. And so as a result, everything um, appeared um, um, very, very small. And um, it was upside down, sorry. And as a result, the, um, um, yeah, um, just one moment, Dustin. Sorry, Dustin, just, um, just had someone at the door. Yeah, so the picture was upside down. And because he had, didn't have the picture settings correct, it was very dark. And so NASA then switched to the pictures shortly afterward to the pictures coming from Honeysuckle Creek, which were the right way up and a little brighter, but they still weren't very good. So they asked the, the guy at Goldstone to fix his image. So they switched back to him, but in trying to fix it, he made it a negative. Oh my God, you know? And then NASA then switched away again, switched to, um, to back to Honeysuckle Creek, told him to put the image back, which he did, but it was still very dark. And by then, um, the moon had fully moved into the field of view of the Parkes telescope. And when they switched to Parkes, it was so much better. They stayed with Parkes for the rest of the five-hour transmission. And um, But it wasn't an accident that Parkes were the best picture. It was always intended to have the best picture because it was always designed to be the prime station for the TV. The people operating the scan converter and all the equipment were the most experienced. They were the people who actually designed the equipment. And so they knew what they were doing. And so um, the world was able to witness it. So for the first eight minutes or so, the world saw the picture switching between Goldstone and Honeysuckle Creek. And that included the time when um, Armstrong stepped on the moon, which pictures was, came through Honeysuckle for that. But when they switched to parks, it was so much better. They just stayed with, didn't even switch away after that. They just said, leave it. And the amazing thing was in that entire period, the winds remained very high. The tower was still being buffeted. And in fact, um, later on, it even hailed at parks. With the, and, and yet the signal did not degrade at all. In fact, unless people told them what was happening, they had no idea what was happening at parks. That's how good the support was. And, um, and then at about um, five to six in the evening, they finally switched off the TV cameras after the astronauts had re-entered the lunar module for their well-earned sleep. And, uh, and that was the end of our support. They only really needed us for those few hours. But um, it became such a dramatic event, of course, not just because of the first landing, but all the things that were happening at Park, that in 1999, the, the working dog company decided to make a film about it. They did exaggerate a lot of what happened there. They, um, they, they took events that occurred at parks, mixed it with things, combined it with things that happened at other tracking stations, both during Apollo 11 and other missions, mixed it all together. 
exaggerated some things, made up other things, and then said it was based on true events. <laughs> okay, so don't don't take the film as a documentary, but they did get the gist of the story right. Um, Parks did receive the T uh, Australia did receive the TV pictures and broadcast to six hundred million people live across the world. Okay, and it was so successful that we were asked to support Apollo twelve. Um, the, in four months later. And then in particular, we weren't going to be tracking Apollo 13 because the moon was barely above our horizon. It was so far north at the time. But when the accident occurred, they suddenly needed parks. And then we were able to, the, the astronomers here were able to get the telescope um, working and tracking the thing within hours of the request coming in. Um, so that was phenomenal. We also supported Apollo 15, um, which was the first of the J missions, the one that had the, the, the lunar rover for the first time. And we were on standby for Apollo's 14, 16, and 17 in case something went wrong there. Um, and so in the end, you know, um, it was a, a great thing. During Apollo 11, there was no power failure. Um, they, had, they, had, they had main supply, they had generators, they had batteries. They even practiced hand cranking the thousand ton dish to track it across the sky if they did lose all power. So um, that, was, that was an exaggeration. But on the Saturday um, prior to the moonwalk, on the Monday, on the 19th of July, there was a fire in the power supply to the number two transmitter at Tidbimbilla. And the engineers there worked frantically all night to get it repaired, which they did. But by the morning, um, the um, NASA had lost confidence and they wanted to make sure that, you know, it didn't happen during the, the moonwalk. So they switched their roles with Honeysuckle Creek. Um, so in the film, that became a power failure at Parks where they frantically try and find the spacecraft. And then the, the mayor asked the, the director, well, what's the worst that can happen if you tell me? And then the director says, well, they could take the moonwalk away from us. So that it was based on, on that event, but it didn't happen at Parks. We were fully prepared for everything. The one thing they couldn't prepare for was the weather with the wind and the storm. But, and that's, that's one aspect of the film that, that they did get right. It's just that they didn't make it dramatic enough in the film. In the, in the, here it was really very, very windy with hail and, and everything. And so um, uh, in many ways, it was even more dramatic in real life. So, but that aspect of the film was right. We had, we had many, many people working. It was more than four people. There were four Americans, but there were the Australians here were were vastly outnumbered the Americans. Um, all subsequent missions, they had Australians here working. They came from Tidbin Villa to, to operate the equipment. So, um, um, so Parks' role in, in space tracking, as I said, has been quite substantial, you know. Um, the first impact was in the design of the big antennas for, for tracking spacecraft in deep space. And then um, our other um, um, contributions were in receiving signals from those original, um, from those historic first missions, you know, to Venus, Mars, the Moon, the outer planets, and then out into interstellar space. And so it's a, it's a great legacy. It's something that all Australians are rightly proud of. Um, and, you know, but we're not finished yet. We're not resting on our laurels. We're still looking to the future, looking to do great things. And so in beginning next year, when we begin tracking those, those first commercial landers, and hopefully, fingers crossed, the first man landing, we turn to the moon um, in 2024, maybe 2025, um, you know, parks will be involved also. Because the thing that allows parks is the size, and that's hard to duplicate. You can build a small antenna for a, a million dollars or two, but to build a large antenna like the one behind me there, um, you know, requires a lot more. It requires um, it, it, it requires um, you know hundreds of million dollars to build, and no one's going to do that nowadays. It's easier just to rent us for a few hours and for a few days to do it, and we're always happy to do that because we plow the money back into the into the equipment and to the work that we do here, so that Australia um, is able to maintain its preeminent position in wor in world radio astronomy. Thank you. I've got a few other. Uh, smaller yep. questions. One of yep. them was, uh, is the telescope more resistant to the winds? To the what, sorry? To the winds. The wind. The wind. Okay. Well, you can see, you've seen pictures of the telescope. It looks like a glorified beach umbrella, Dustin. Okay. 
And just like a beach umbrella, when the wind blows, it puts a lot of force, a lot of loading on the dish. And so when the winds reach a certain critical speed that we consider is unsafe, usually around 35 to 40 kilometers an hour, we park the telescope. We drive it up, point it straight up where it's safe. And in the, and in the safe position, it can withstand winds of over 200 kilometers an hour, uh, which is cyclonic, and we never get that here. The highest winds ever recorded here uh, are around 110 kilometers an hour. And in fact, in the first 10 years of the park's telescope's operation, those winds were recorded minutes before Apollo 11. And, but that was when it was, it wasn't parked at the time, it was fully tipped over at its most vulnerable. Um, I've been in the telescope when we've had winds that high, only once in the 25 years that I've been here, but it was stowed at the time. And I was grateful it was stowed because the, side of the building suddenly shakes when, when you're hit with those gusts. And so, <coughs> um, and we have upgraded the telescope. Originally the, the, the surface was made up of steel wire mesh panels. Um, you can see on the photograph behind me there, um, it, it looks very transparent. It looks, it's just made of chicken wire, essentially. And over the years, beginning in 1970, we replaced the inner 55 metres with those white perforated aluminium panels. And that's made it less resistant to the wind, but they're lighter than the steel mesh. And so the balance point hasn't shifted. If we were to extend those panels all the way to the edge there, then... Um, the extra loading on the dish won't be compensated by the, the lighter panels. And so we'd be stowing at even lower wind speeds, which means we'll be offline even more often. Every year we lose about 3% of observing time because of high winds. Okay. If we would extend it further, um, we'll probably lose about 5% of observing time due to wind, which we don't want to do. We want to use it, maximize it for radio astronomy. Um, the reason why the site was chosen was because it's it's relatively free of high winds. The windiest time of the year is for, is in our summer months, from November to February, um, um, where you can be wind parked several times every day, you know, um, depending on the on the weather. Um, the least windy time is the winter, from about May to August. You could go the entire period without a single wind park. Um, that's why Apollo Eleven was so unusual it happened in july when we don't normally have high winds <laughs> and of course of all the times for the high winds to occur minutes before the moonwalk was to begin my goodness you, you couldn't have timed the dramatic events better than that um so it's unlikely that we'll um we'll change the rules because we don't want to put the dish under undue stress and strain um we're pretty much fixed on that um the the way to avoid not losing time because the wind is to build it in a location where there's not much wind. And so the Goog Bang Valley in the just north of Parks is, is a pretty good location. My only other two questions were, one of them is, uh, when did Parks become heritage listed? And for okay. what main reason? Okay, the Parks Telescope uh, in, I think it was the 10th of October last year, 2020, the Parks Telescope um, was listed on the National Heritage Register. And because it was, um, um, it exemplified the very best in Australian science and technology. Uh, it was recognised for its design, which became the model for all subsequent large single dish antennas, and especially for the, the large antennas in NASA's tracking network. It was also recognised for the great contribution it's made to radio astronomy and science in general, completely revolutionised with some of its discoveries, the, our ideas of the universe and our place within it. Um, and also it was recognized for its um, amazing contribution to the to space tracking and in particular to the Apollo 11 mission, which was a seminal moment in human history. Um, and, um, you know, and Parks was, was there to allow the world to witness that signal moment um, with the greatest possible clarity. And, um, and you know, and the world recognised it as such. It was a, a really great achievement, and um, for those reasons, um, it it was listed in the National Heritage Register um, to recognise those achievements, but also to protect it. Um, it allows us, it gives us some legislative protection, so that people can't go and build, you know, um, factories next door or other other things that might. Um, cause the situation around parks to deteriorate to the point where we can no longer do radio astronomy. So it gives us some protection, legislative protection, 
so that we can continue doing the world-class science here at, here at Parks. Uh, thank you. My last other question is, uh, what career path do you have to follow to get a job at Parks? Okay. Well, there are many. Um, here at Parks, we, we have um, engineers, we have technicians, we have astronomers. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things you can do here. Uh, my background is in applied physics. I have an applied physics degree. And, um, uh, but I work with people who have astronomy degrees, others that are engineers, others that are electricians and, um, and other technicians, you know, fitters and turners that maintain the mechanical structure of the, the telescope and so on. So um, there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, but here at Parks, we only have about, ten, about 11 or so employees, but we're part of a much larger organisation within CSRO called Space and Astronomy. And within that, we have um, something like 150 people working for us. Um, we have a headquarters in Sydney, um, but we also have um, um, our sister observatory at Narrabri and the new facilities we're building in Western Australia with the Australian Square Kilometre Ray Pathfinder at the Murchison Radio Observatory site there and also the new Square Kilometre Array. The low frequency array is being built on our Murchison Radio Astronomy site. Um, and so there'll be increasing employment on that. Um, nowadays, a lot of things are becoming software driven. So we have, we have a lot of need for programmers and software engineers and IT professionals, um, electronic engineers, computer engineers, um, mechanical engineers, um, structural and so on. Um, and, and not just astronomers, but, but, um, but engineers and technicians that are, that are um, you know, that, that, that are interested in being involved in this really exciting field. Um, so there's many, many, many ways of, of being employed within the industry. Um, um, so Parks, as I said, just a very small location, but it's part of a much larger thing. And of course, worldwide, there are other observatories that you can work on. Um, a lot of Australians work in other observatories around the world. Um, so there is a lot of opportunity out there. Um, but I don't want to exaggerate, you know, and say there's a lot of work. Everyone that wants to work will they just they won't you won't be able to. So to, to be there, you really need to be at the very top of your field. You know, put your head down, do your studies, do as well as you can, um, and um, and be enthusiastic. And always remember that it's that it's fun. You know, that you want to enjoy doing it. Also, thanks for your time. Yeah, no worries.